Our loving Heavenly Father, we come in the name of Jesus. And we recognize that to come in the name of Jesus means more than a statement. To come in the name of Jesus means that we have to come saying what he said. And when he approached unto thee, he said, not my will, but I will be done. And Lord, this is what we are praying. Uh, this is what we are desiring. And not only in this prayer, but Lord, may it be the theme of every prayer uh, that we would approach unto you not with a to-do list of what you must do in order for us to be happy. But Lord, may it rather be, what would you have us to do? Uh, we want to surrender our hearts. We want to acknowledge our great need. Your word makes it very clear, and our lives have made it clear that we are guilty sinners. We are always in need of a Savior, and we are thankful that our unrighteousness has made us candidates for heaven, has made us candidates for salvation even. And Lord, we want to just come to you. We want to be right with you even now. We may be able to look even through our day to see corruption, to see evil. We grant, we count this moment to be a great privilege to approach unto thee. Uh, though our hands may be bloody, we may be right with you. If we are willing to acknowledge our sins, if we're willing to confess, if we're willing to forsake, uh, then your word makes it very clear that we can be accepted in the beloved. And this is what our desire is. Even as we handle your word, we do not want to defile it. You have told us in your word that unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto the defiled, even that which is pure becomes defiled. We do not want to take in the oil of grace with old bottles. Uh, may you make us new, that these words that we study will have an influence upon how we live, how we think, how we feel, and what we choose. Lord, please grant us thy spirit in abundance, uh, not according to our merit, but according to the merit of Christ, uh, according to your mercy, according to your promise. May you answer us. Uh, Lord, we believe that you have already answered because you have spoken in your word that if we ask, we shall receive. Now, Lord, as we study, we want to put away our preconceived ideas, our own personal opinions, even our feelings. We want to submit fully and freely to thee, that you may work in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Bless us to this end, and above all, we're praying that a glorious picture of Christ would be seen before us, uh, that we may be drawn to him as our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We are at the, we've been at the end of our study of the seven trumpets for a very long time, and uh, rightfully so. Um, it is totally okay uh, that we're spending so much time um, on this study, uh, only because the end of this study is uh, in reference to our present time. So if we go to Revelation, I'm sorry I said Revelation 11, but let's go to Revelation 8 really quickly. Um, Revelation chapter 8, um, this is just, uh, because we looked at this before, we'll add some additional detail, um, just for those who have already listened, uh, they can still benefit from this study, uh, along with the repetition that we will, we will make, uh, they'll be able to uh, have additional notes. Uh, Revelation 8 is where the prophecy of the seven trumpets are given, um, so we want to read, starting in verse 1, we won't read all of this, but I do want us to get the big picture. Um, so that we can see what uh, what we're dealing with when we approach the seventh trumpet in the third wall. Uh, the Bible says in Revelation 8 and verse 1, it says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, uh, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayer of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. So uh, we talked about this before. Um, the Bible introduces the seven trumpets uh, with seven angels having seven trumpets standing before God. Uh, but then in verse 3 it introduces another angel. Okay, and I'll read it one more time. It says, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that 
he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Um, I don't remember if you all remember when we studied this, but we put effort into showing that this angel is Christ. He is the one that is interceding in our behalf in heaven. He's the only one that has access to our prayers, as it were. And we put a lot of effort. We went through the book of Hebrews. Uh, we looked at just Christ's life in general to show how he is the one that intercedes for us in heaven. Um, although the Bible says that the Holy Spirit also intercedes for us in reference to prayer, Christ specifically is the one that is representing mankind in the heavenly sanctuary as our high priest. So uh, you want to keep that in mind. We won't spend too much time going over that again. Uh, but we talked about the transition here. Okay, and in verse 3, you're seeing a time stamp. Um, if you remember in Revelation chapter 1, if you just run there really quickly, and we'll come back to Revelation chapter 8. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, um, the Bible says here, Revelation chapter 1, uh, let's jump to verse 10 or verse 9, Revelation 1 and verse 9. I'll read quickly. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the hour that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Sm and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. So um, this verse is a time stamp for us. Uh, we know that after Christ resurrected, he went into heaven, but then someone could ask where, okay? Uh, Revelation chapter 1 gives us the location, and we know that this is after AD 31, after Christ was resurrected, okay? So we know that at least from AD 31 until another time, Christ is in the holy place. When we go back to Revelation chapter 8, we notice that he is still in the holy place. Why? Because we're still dealing with the furniture that exists in the holy place, okay? You have the candlestick, you have the table of showbread, also you have the altar of incense just before the veil, okay? So these texts are valuable. There are many who teach a futurist view of the trumpets, and they say that it is in the future, um, and the Bible makes clear that it, it cannot be in the future because Christ was in the holy place at this time. Um, we know that Christ is in the holy place until 1844, until he goes into the most holy place, um, if you read through the churches, he gives a timeline, and when you get to the Church of Philadelphia, I believe, he says, I am the one that has the key of David, uh, the one that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth, or I think it's reverse. But um, he's giving us a witness that there are transitions, there are changes in heaven. Um, I just I recently did a study with an individual who was an Adventist, and they were talking about how someone came to them, and they challenged 1844, and they said, you know, how do we know, you know, October 22nd, 1844 is a real date? You can't come to that date in studying the Bible. You know, there's no prophecy or verse that says it's October 22nd, 1844. And what we did is we spent time in the Bible showing how from the time of Christ's death all the way up until 1844, the fulfillments of prophecy were based on the sanctuary. And the schedule that was given was based on the Jewish calendar. Uh, when Christ died, he died as a Passover at the same time when they were sacrificing the Passover. Um, just shortly after that, there was a Feast of Unleavened Bread. Christ stayed in the grave during the Unleavened Bread. So Christ literally fulfilled those events all the way to the time of the Day of Atonement. So one may say, well, when then? How do we know what day is the Day of Atonement? Well, the 2300-day prophecy gives us the year. Then what gives us the date? The Jewish calendar, brothers and sisters. That's the only way we could know it. So if we would follow God in the sanctuary, then we can understand those things. God gives an addition with the 2300 days to let us know specifically which year we should look for a transition in the heavenly sanctuary. So as I shared with the brother, I said, listen, the message and the truth that God has given us is, a very, is very sound. Uh, the closer you look, the more the more sound it gets, mm -hmm. the stronger it becomes, brothers and sisters. So it just shows that we need to just spend a little bit more time in the Bible. We need to make sure that the things we believe, we have evidence for why we believe it. Not just, I was taught this and I agreed. No, 
You agreed because it was true. That's the reason you agreed. Not just because it made sense, but because you can see there's evidence, there's sound, sure evidence, and it was true. Okay, so now as we get back to Revelation 8, uh, I want you to notice here in Revelation 8, and we're going to read in 8 and uh, 3 and verse 4, because from 3 to 4, I'm sorry, from 3 to 5, you see a transition. Okay, and this transition that's taking place is what happens with the seven trumpets. So at the beginning of the seven trumpets, you still see Christ in the holy place. But at the end of the seven trumpets, you see something a little bit different. Okay, so we're going to see this as we study the seven trumpet. And the Bible says here again in verse 3, it says, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. And then verse 5 is another time stamp. It says, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and a great, or pardon me, and an earthquake. So if you notice... There's a time where these prayers are being offered with this censer, and then there's a time where that censer is thrown down, okay? That's a transition, okay? We're talking about a time now where prayers are no longer being offered in the sanctuary. Hmm. Now, you have to say, wait a minute, what, what time is it when Christ no longer has to offer the prayers of the saints? When does that time ever arrive? When Michael stands up. When Michael stands up at the close of probation. And you may say, well, that's a dangerous time period. Well, at the close of probation, the relationship between God and those people are forever sealed. They can speak to God directly. They, they have such a close relationship with God that now they can live with God in his presence. Hmm. So that separation that existed because of sin no longer exists at this point, brothers and sisters. So this is bringing us to the, as we, what we will say is the end of time, okay? So this is how the trumpets are introduced, which means as we go through the trumpets, at the beginning of the trumpets, it's going to begin during the time where Christ is still ministering in the holy place. It's going to end when Christ has finished his ministry in the most holy place. I hope that makes sense, okay? Mm -hmm. So when we go back to Revelation 11... This is the picture that we're seeing in Revelation 11 at the end of Revelation 11. Okay, so we want to just go back here to make sure. And I was contemplating this and I said, Lord, this is amazing that we're actually living at this time. Like we're literally living at the end where we will be among those who will see prophecy. There are many groups of believers who lived during times where very little prophetic events were being fulfilled. Not us, brothers and sisters. We are one of the groups that have been graciously blessed. Even the wicked are blessed to see God in the world. I, I, I mean, it's just the truth. Even though many are not going to be saved, the fact that they will be able to see God work in the world is an amazing thing. Because, you know, everybody's looking for miracles and real things. And for the most part, all of these miraculous events that are happening in the earth are, for the most part, manipulation. It's Satan. Trickery. It's fate. You see what I'm saying? So when we are able to actually see real spiritual work as at the hand of God, it's an amazing reality for us. So we are quite privileged to live in this time, brothers and sisters. We're going to Revelation chapter 11. And I always say this, but I do believe that this is one of our last studies on the seventh trumpet and the third woe. Maybe the second to last, okay? Uh, because there's uh, just maybe two more things we may revisit. Um, as we study other things because they're directly tied. Uh, but in reference to Revelation 11, uh, we're, we're just about done. So the Bible says here, Revelation 11. Now, uh, go to Revelation 10, I'm sorry. I want you to see this in Revelation 10 also. Uh, Revelation 10, and the Bible says here in Revelation chapter 10, and we're going to start here in verse 7. Revelation 10 and verse 7, and the Bible simply says here in verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, okay? So in Revelation chapter 8 is where we have the beginning of the trumpets, okay? When we get to Revelation 10, we're being introduced to the beginning of the end of the trumpets. And I'm not trying to do a wordplay. 
but the Bible introduces the end of the trumpets by showing the beginning of the end in verse 7. Okay, now let's make sure. Again, it says in verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel. Okay, the seventh angel is a representation of the seventh trumpet. He says, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And what we did in our last study, we'll do this again today and we'll make some additional notes is that we showed how the prophets in general spoke on this event of the seven trumpet. How do we know they're speaking of the seven trumpet? Well, Revelation chapter 10 and verse 7 tells us that the other prophets have spoken of this reality. So although we don't read them saying, hey, this is the seven trumpet, we know that in the prophet's writings, they are writing about the seven trumpet. This is a very important event to mankind, okay? So... We want to understand here that the Bible shows us that when this trumpet begins to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. So we've already studied this and showed how this is bringing us to the close of probation. The Bible doesn't say that we wait till the end of the seventh trumpet for probation to close. It says in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. A work is closing. We need to have that in our mind. I always say, brothers and sisters, we have a very short time to take advantage of grace. And what that simply means is we have a very short time to be taught to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, and that we should no, we have been we have a very short time to be taught to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, and that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We have a short time to do that. Okay, we have to make the most of all the grace we receive, okay? Mm -hmm. So, this is the beginning of the end of the trumpets. What is the end of the end of the trumpets? Okay, and I'm not trying to confuse anyone, but this is how the Bible presents it. It's in Revelation 11, okay? So this is, again, where we're picking up our study. This is the end of the seven trumpets, okay? The Bible says here, we already looked in Revelation chapter uh, 10. There was another verse I wanted to read, but we'll go to Re Revelation 11. And I'm going to start in verse 14. 11, Reve one? Reve Revelation 11 and verse 14. 14. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Revelation 11 and verse 14. And the Bible reads here, it says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Now, I, I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. When you go through the woes, uh, you're going to see in Revelation 9, specifically where... Uh, the fifth and the sixth trumpet is given. It's also where the first and the second woe is given. Mm -hmm. You're going to see, in order to understand those woes, God gives us a time prophecy for each woe. Okay? The first woe had a 150-year time prophecy. The second woe had a 391-year and 15-day prophecy. That fifth and sixth trumpet is the trumpets that bring us to 1844. Remember the second woe ends with August 11, 1840? But the trumpet continues to blow until 1844. Keep that in mind, brothers and sisters. And when 1844 comes, the Bible is very specific. God says, there shall be time no longer. Mm -hmm. So we cannot look for a time prophecy for the third woe. Does that make sense? This time no longer. Nevertheless, the Bible does say when it comes to the seventh trumpet that it is the time of the trumpet, okay? And we've read that when we read through the book of Joel. We looked in also the book of Zephaniah to deal with this day of the Lord, the time of God or the time of this trumpet. There is not a set time as a time prophecy, but the Bible does say it is the time of the trumpet, okay? And we may have to look at that, but I want you to be aware that when it comes to the third woe, because it comes after 1844, we can no longer look for a time prophecy in reference to the woe. But before 1844, there are two time prophecies specifically associated with the first woe, 150 years, and the second woe, 391 years and 15 days. Okay, So you have to put that in your notes. I think we talked about uh, the beginning time was July 27, 1299. 150 years brings you to July 27, 1449. From 1449 of July 27, you had 391 years and 15 days. That's going to bring you to August 11th, 1840. Okay, those are the time prophecies associated with the woes. And I tell people, 
We need to be very cautious how we deal with time prophecies. A lot of times we hear numbers and we're not familiar with them, and we say, ah, I'm not, I don't like that, or I'm not agreeing with that. You better go back and make sure to see if it's biblical before you decide. Don't think it's bad because the numbers sound funny or because maybe it's unfamiliar. Because there's a host of time prophecies that maybe you've never heard of. Like, have you ever heard of the 360 days? See? You need to go back and study, brothers and sisters. Okay? So, the Bible says in Revelation 11, let's get back to this. In verse 14, it says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. It says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Okay? The Bible says, When the seventh angel sounds, Okay. Now, Revelation 10, we saw, we saw that in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God will be finished. But then we get to verse 15, and the Bible says that seventh angel has sounded. Okay, It says something has taken place. So what is the event that takes place under the seventh angel? I'll read it again. It says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying. So notice. In order to understand the event of the seventh angel, we have to notice the response of those who are part of the event. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The Bible says there are those who are in heaven that are speaking. What are they speaking about? Well, let's make sure. It says, saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So notice, in heaven it is said... That the kingdom of this world, in other words, the earth, the kingdoms of the earth have now become the kingdoms of heaven or the kingdoms of God. In other words, these two kingdoms have been blended. Are we together? Mm -hmm. Now, if you go back to Daniel 2, we talked about this. But this is confirmed in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. And the Bible says here in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, we're going to read here Daniel chapter 2, we're going to start in verse, hmm, let's start in verse 30, 36, actually let's start in verse 40, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 40, now we remember what is said under the seventh trumpet, okay, it says there are voices in heaven, that said, the kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And he shall reign, remember, forever and ever. A transition has happened. The kingdoms have been given to Jesus. Okay? So the Bible says here in verse 40, it says, The fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And notice verse 44 is key. It says, and in the days of these, what? Kings. kings. Is that singular or plural? Plural. Wait a minute. In reference to the fourth kingdom, how many kings does the Bible say is there? Our sister already answered. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yes, amen. Now that's amen. true. That's amen. true. That's where we're actually going. Amen. But verse 44 says, in the days and in the days of these kings, notice, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. So notice, this kingdom that God is going to set up, we just read about it in Revelation 11. Okay? I'll keep reading. It says, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So the same thing we read in Revelation chapter 11 is the same thing we're reading about in Daniel chapter 2. And that is, after the fourth kingdom, God sets up his kingdom. And that kingdom will last forever. The reason why we're here studying the Bible today is because we want to be a part of that kingdom, brothers and sisters. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, 
God is trying to give us the big picture of the events that are taking place. So when we go back to Revelation 11, let's go back there. When we go back to Revelation 11, the Bible says here in Revelation 11, we're going to read verse 15 just one more time. We're going to notice what is being said here. Revelation 15 is very interesting. What is being said in regards to heaven. Um, we need to be aware of this. I've talked about it a lot. But whenever there is a transition in heaven, there is an earthly counterpart. Okay. Whenever there's a transition or a change in heaven, there's an earthly counterpart. That's why we study prophecy. Prophecy shows us what God is doing. Okay. It is directly connected to the work of God. We need to always have that in our mind. Okay. So the Bible says again here, verse 15, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. And of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The question now is then, what happens on the earth? When that transition happens in heaven, what is taking place on the earth? Okay, well, go back to Daniel now. Let's go to Daniel 12. Daniel chapter 12. And as I said, if you took notes last time, I would encourage you to still take notes today because we're adding a lot more to the study than we studied last time. Daniel chapter 12, and we're going to read here in verse 1. And remember, Daniel and Revelation, they are one book. Okay, we one explains the other, they are both speaking the same things. But we're going to say, we're going to see today later in our study that not only are Daniel and John speaking the same things, but Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Hosea, Amos, Joel, Zephaniah, Nahum, Obadiah, all of these men are speaking of the same things. So the Bible says here, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, And at that time shall Michael do what? Stand up. Stand up. Now, if you read through Daniel chapter 11, in Daniel chapter 11, whenever the Bible says someone will stand up, you're seeing a transition, believe it or not. Okay, so you can look at this in your own time. We won't go through all the verses, but I would encourage you to go back to Daniel chapter 11, compare it to Daniel chapter 7, <coughs> pardon me, and as you go through the kings, Every time the kingdom transitions, every time it changes from Babylon, pardon me, not Babylon, but from Greece or Medo-Persia to Greece and Greece to Rome, it's going to say, and another king stands up, and another king stands up. So when we get to Daniel chapter 12 and it says, and Michael stands up, it's showing us another kingdom is beginning, okay? Mm -hmm. Now remember, every time there's a transition in heaven, there is an earthly counterpart. Something else is happening on the earth. So the Bible says here, and at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And then it says, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was, since there was a nation even to that same time. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. In the same verse, the Bible shows in heaven what's taking place, and it shows the earthly counterpart. Mm -hmm. At the same time that Michael is standing up in heaven, the Bible says on the earth there is a time of trouble, such as never was. Okay. Now keep that in mind. Okay, stamp that in your mind. We're going to come back to that. Let's go back to Revelation 11. And brothers and sisters, so often when we are studying these things and we're going verse to verse and we're looking at all these things, I always think about the time where I neglected Bible study. And I say, Lord, have mercy on me because there's so many layers, there's so many different topics, there's so many events, there's so many perspectives, there's so much, brothers and sisters. We really don't have time to waste. I hope we consider that. I know we're busy, but we should not be that busy, brothers and sisters. Is that why you started your 6.30 Bible study on Sundays? Uh, well, I started my 6.30 Bible study on Sundays by accident. <laughs> <laughs> I, gave, I gave the group a time when to start, and they were contacting me early in the morning, and I'm saying, why is everyone contacting me? And I look at the messages, and the messages were saying, you're not, on the, you're not on the conference call yet. So I called in and we did the study and it ended up remaining. <laughs> so that's how we, that's how, but nevertheless, the purpose of God was that we would study more. So yes, yes, you're very right. So the Bible says here in Revelation 12, okay, we are looking at a lot of things. So far, we've been, 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 been able to establish that after the fourth kingdom is a fifth kingdom. That's the kingdom of heaven. That's the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom where Christ is reigning. We are supposed to be the subjects of that kingdom. That was God's plan from the beginning of time. Okay, 
We are looking at the events that lead up into that point. Okay? So the Bible says, Revelation 11. I'll read 15 one more time. It says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. And verse 16 says, And the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped, saying. So notice, there's a first group that is mentioned in heaven speaking. Now there's another group about to speak. So it's important to consider what they are saying because they are giving insight on the events taking place in heaven as well as in earth. So what do the 24 elders see? And it's very interesting to consider these 24 elders are from the earth. So don't be surprised if they speak about the earth. Are you following? Let's see what they say. Where are we again? I'm sorry. Revelation 11 and verse 17. Can we be clear on who these 24 elders are? Are, they, are these those from the earth that when uh, Christ uh, was resurrected mm -hmm. and then there were those that went to heaven with him? Good question. Um, I guess we can look at that very quickly. Go over to Revelation chapter 4, I think it is. Revelation chapter 4, and the Bible says, Revelation chapter 4, I think it is here. It may be Revelation 5. Let me just check. Revelation chapter 4, uh, verse 10, I think. Revelation chapter 4, and verse 10, it says, The four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped. And worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. That's not the exact text I was looking for. Four, four. Is it 4-4? Four, four? Uh, that that's a good text. Uh, it speaks of the same thing, but it's the one that sent. They basically say that they were redeemed from the earth. Okay. That's Revelation. Is it Revelation? Twelve. I don't know. Redeemed. Mm-hmm. Wait, not twelve. Um, Let 14? me check. <laughs> Fourteen three. Mm, maybe so. When they use terminology as returning, redeemed from the earth, they were they were dead. Oh yes. Okay. In other words, the Bible identifies them as coming from earth. That's mm -hmm. the verse I'm looking for. Right. So. Let's study, and then I'll try to, in my mind, as we're going okay. through it, I'll yeah. see if I can come back to that. That may be a, may end up being another study in itself. 14.4. Is it 14.4? These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they no. which... No, that's not your That's not your report. That's not your um, does, does the verse say 24 elders? Uh, it's them speaking again, and they're, giving, they're, making, they're making a reference... To what God has done in their behalf. Uh, so I'll try to think of it. Okay. Uh, and the number of them. It'll come. Yeah, we can come back to that. Later. Yeah, let's try to do that. Um, but for those who are thinking about it, if it's pressing your mind, if you go back and you study the sanctuary, uh, the high priest had 24 priests that helped him. Okay. So it's just a, it's the same pattern. When Christ went to be our high priest, he also had his 24 elders or other priests that would help him in his service. So, uh, Lord willing, the verses can come to my mind and we can address that. I always wondered if, if, if uh, these 24 were uh, all of those that went to heaven with Christ mm -hmm. from the grave. Or Good question. A, 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 a part of those. Or a portion of them. A portion. Yeah. I've always wondered that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's why I said I want to read yeah. uh, the verses that yeah. they speak in regards to what God has done for them personally. Their testimony is probably the best testimony we can use. Mm -hmm. So as I as we go through the study, I'll try to think of it. If not, I'll just get my phone and search it. Okay. Um, but Revelation 11, uh, we're reading about the 24 elders here. And hmm, it may, not, may, may be here, actually. Revelation 11 here, and we're looking at verse 16. Yeah, that's the one. Revelation 11 and verse 16, and the Bible says, And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their face, I'm sorry, on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because <laughs> thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And then verse 18, they're still talking, okay? Mm -hmm. 
Verse 18 says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants and prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So notice, the 24 elders, as they speak, they speak in reference to what is taking place on the earth. And it is often that you'll see that they are specifically interested in what happens on the earth. And that's the reason because they are also from the earth. Mm -hmm. But here specifically, they give us a lot of insight of the final events. Okay? So again, I want to read it, but I want you to listen closely to the events that are mentioned because they are given in chronological order. Okay? Things in Revelation are not always written in chronological order, but what these 24 elders say is in chronological order, and we can confirm that from the Bible. So it says here, Revelation 11 and verse 18 again, it says, and the nations were angry. Now, is that past tense, present tense, or future tense? That's now. That's past tense, right? No, that's past. Now, understand, this is from the perspective of the 24 elders. Mm. When they speak here, they said, and the nations were angry. What time is this when they're speaking? Well, this is the time where Christ is the king. Don't forget. So they, what they're saying here is a future experience. I hope you caught that. Are we understanding? I'll read it one more time. Okay. Let's see. In verse 7, it says, and the seventh angel sounded. So what is the time stamp here? The Once the seventh angel sounds, right? And then the Bible says, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So at this point, the time stamp is when Christ is now reigning, and he will continue to reign forever and ever. Are we together? Okay. Now, when we get to the 24 elders, they're speaking of the same time. Are we together? In other words, they are speaking in harmony with, was, with what was already said. So they're their, their perspective is at a time where Christ is king. Are we together? Okay. okay. So the Bible says here, And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, notice, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. So what time is this? When Christ, when Christ is, is reigning. reigning. This so, hasn't happened yet. This has not happened yet. Okay. okay? okay. Because we're still waiting <laughs> exactly. for Michael to stand up. So this right? is why you said in the perspective. In of their the, perspective. In their perspective. Yes. So they're really looking. God is giving us what they're going to say in the future. Exactly. Yes. Okay. 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 And we'll, we'll, we can confirm this. Let's see. Right. The Bible says in verse 18, and the nations were angry and thy wrath, what? Yes. Is, is come. So what is the perspective? During the time where the plagues are falling, when the wrath of God has come already. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Has the wrath of God come yet? No. 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 So this is still a future experience. Right. So from their perspective, the nations were angry. They're saying that the nations were angry before the wrath came. So again, mm -hmm. when, it, when it says, and the nations were angry. Yes. Could we conclude mm -hmm. that... Okay, we, we already established that they're looking backward. Yes. And that time hasn't come yet. Yes, or his wrath has come. That time hasn't come yet. Right. But now, the nations are angry right now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. I hope that makes sense. Exactly. Okay, so it may be a little confusing, but remember, we're reading at the time where Christ is now king, mm -hmm. where he has accepted the kingdom and he is reigning. Mm -hmm. So when they say, the nations were angry and thy wrath has come, they're speaking from the perspective of the wrath of God has already taken place. It's already been poured out. Okay? And just to confirm, go over to Revelation chapter 15. Revelation 15 and verse 1, just so we can be clear on what the wrath of God is. The Bible says in verse 1, it says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So when they say, And thy wrath is come, they're talking about the seven last plagues. Have the seven last plagues come yet? No. No. So when we're going back to Revelation 11, the time frame here or the timeline is that before the seven last plagues, the nations are going to be angry. Are we together? Okay. Now that's very important for us to understand prophecy. 
If we can understand this idea or this time where the nations are angry, we can know where we stand or what time we're living in. Okay? So let's go back and read Revelation 11. We're going to read verse 18 again. We're going to see that this is in chronological order. The Bible says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. Now consider, okay? Mm. Nations are angry, the seven last plagues, and then the time of the dead that they should be judged. What judgment is this? Oh, the thousand years. The thousand year, year judgment, yeah. right? Yeah. right? Because remember, the investigative judgment is happening during the time where the nations are angry, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So after the nations are angry, then the plagues fall, right? The wrath of God comes, and then the time for the dead to be judged, the wicked dead, yeah. oh. the thousand years, right? Mm -hmm. Then the Bible says, and that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and, notice, shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So this goes from the beginning of the millennium all the way to the end, where the wicked are fully destroyed. This verse here literally shows <laughs> us where we are in history. It does. And how close Christ's second coming is. Yes, it does. Have mercy. It does. So we want to focus in on that time before the wrath of God. Okay, That time before the wrath of God is called the time when the nations are angry. And that's what we have studied. We've studied it multiple times, but it is present truth. So it is relevant, more relevant than ever. Okay, mm -hmm. So let's go back over this really quickly. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 21. Please write these in your notes. And please teach this to someone, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. So you can remember it. The Bible says here, Luke 21. We're going to start in verse 25. Now, don't forget the timeline, okay? That is our, our basis for our study, okay? The nations will be angry. Then God's wrath is going to come, the seven last plagues. Then after that, it doesn't really matter what we really go into because that's the end, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we do want to understand because really God gives us the full end of the story because it reveals his glory, it reveals his character. Mm -hmm. And we don't know this, but... Actually, when the wicked are destroyed, it shows the love of God. Mm -hmm. We don't understand that. If you want to understand that, go back and read chapter 1 of Steps of Christ. In chapter 1 of Steps of Christ, it is made very clear that the wicked would be afraid to live in God's presence. Mm -hmm. It would be like torture, yes. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be in God's presence. Um, this is evident by the uh, statements after the sixth seal in Revelation chapter 6. Hide us from the face of the lamb. That is an interesting statement. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a lamb? <laughs> They're not scary, brothers and sisters. Yeah. Very timid. Loving creatures. Mm -hmm. Afraid of you, maybe. But these people are afraid of such a lovely Jesus. Mm -hmm. So it shows us, brothers and sisters, that they have believed Satan's lie. and They've misunderstood God's character. They don't want to be around God. They would prefer Satan, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. So it's very sad to consider. But the Bible says in Luke chapter 21 and verse 25. Luke 21 and verse 25 in the Bible says here, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the earth, pardon me, and in the stars, uh, and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. This is another example of how God is giving this uh, literally, because this was a prophetic event, this is the sixth seal, but God is always trying to make it clear to us that whatever happens in the heaven has an earthly counterpart. What happens in the sun, moon, and stars is still the heavens. I hope you know that, brothers and sisters. He says these are, there are going to be things happening in the heavens. Then he says, and on the earth, there's going to be things happening. He wants us to have this in our mind that what happens in heaven is connected to the events happening on the earth. Okay, The Bible says, finishing, and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart felling them for what? Fear. Fear. Fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So the Bible makes it very clear that the time just before us is going to be a very tough time. 
And we read in uh, 1 Samuel. Let's run there really quickly. As we're running there, we just read in verse 25 about the signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Mm -hmm. Now, we know about those things that happened in, what are those years? Mm -hmm. No, not the lunar calendar. No, no, no. The great dark day. Yes. Yes. Is this referring to that? Yes. That is the sixth seal. Okay, you can read about it there. All the prophets speak on it. You can read Isaiah 13. Isaiah speaking on it. You can read Joel chapter 2. Joel is speaking on it. The prophets speak a great deal about the sixth seal. It's all over the Bible. Okay, so something you want to consider in your own time. We're going to 1 Samuel 28. So yes, you're right. Uh, Christ is talking about the sixth seal. Okay, He's talking about the events of the sixth seal and the events that will follow shortly thereafter, which is the events under the seventh trumpet. Okay, So the Bible says in 1 Samuel 28, we're just going to go here. Uh, as I said, we've gone through this, but I'm giving just reference text because this is all review, believe it or not. Okay, But for those who are not here, I would... Uh, I would not feel right if you guys did not at least get the gist so that you can go back and see whether these things are so. So 1 Samuel 28 and verse 15 is going to help us with understanding what we read in Luke chapter 21 and verse 25. So the Bible says in 1 Samuel 28 and verse 15, in verse 15 it says, And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed. For the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. So, uh, if you notice what we read in Luke chapter 21 and verse 25, and re specifically in reference to what is happening on the earth. Everybody remember what the Bible says? No? Let's go back. Hold your finger in 1 Samuel. Uh, that was in Revelation. Yes, but it's the same. Believe it or not. So let's go back to Revelation. I'm sorry, back to Luke. I just want you to see it and read it for yourself. That's all. Yes, Luke 21. We're going to identify what the Bible says here. Luke 21 and verse 25. Again, it says, And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, what? Distress. The stress of nations. So, in reference to the end of time, when God speaks of the nations, he says they're going to be in distress. distress. In Revelation, he says the nations will be angry. angry. So we want to see if this is the same thing or if this is different. Okay. So as we go back to 1 Samuel 28 and verse 15. Verse 15, the story of 1 Samuel 28, the entire chapter, the story is very important to us. Because this is a story of when someone who God has chosen goes into apostasy or they go into spiritualism even. Okay, That was King Saul. God had a high desire for him to fulfill a high position to lead his people, but he was unwilling to yield his heart. He was unwilling to follow God. If you really look closely at Saul's life, he had the religion of many today, and that is... I do a lot of what God says. I don't do all of what God says. Mm -hmm. You go back and read his story. That is Saul at his best. Yes, Lord, I did what you said. He didn't see anything wrong with his condition. He was rich and increased with goods. He said, Lord, I did everything. And when the prophet spoke, he says, why do I hear this? And this is why Satan is putting away the writings of the prophet. Because the writings of the prophet will do for us. What Samuel did for Saul, and that is, it allows us to examine ourselves a little better than we usually do. Amen. It allows us to look very close to see if we are doing all of the will of God. So I encourage you, brothers and sisters, don't believe those who are trying to disprove and go against the writings of our prophet. <laughs> the Bible says in 1 Samuel 20, uh, 28 and verse 15, listen closely. It says, And Samuel said to Saul, why hast thou disquieted me? Now, right now, Saul is with the witch of Endor. So Saul is involved in spiritualism. That can give us a lot of insight in regards to our time in which we're living. Mm. What is going to happen to many of God's people at the end of time? They're going to go into spiritualism. Mm -hmm. They're going to go to seek for the word of God where the word of God cannot be found. Mm -hmm. We had all this time with the prophet's writings and we challenged them and we questioned them. Then in the end of time, you're going to be surprised at how many people try to pick up these books that we read now and say, this is the truth. 
it's going to be too late, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. So we need to take advantage. The story of Saul teaches us that. We need to treat the prophet's words with great value. Uh, now he is speaking to a devil, mm. for those who are asking. It says, And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am what? Sore, Sore distressed. Sore distressed. Now wait a minute. We read in Luke that the nations are going to be distressed, right? Mm -hmm. Now why was Saul distressed? Well, the Bible says, For the Philistines make war against me. So why would the nations be distressed in the end of time? Because the nations are angry. Because they are angry. They are warring. They are fighting. Okay? That's what the Bible teaches us in regards to Islam. Well, that's what we're studying. Yes. <laughs> the nations are angry. The nations are distressed. It is because there are wars taking place among the nations. And this idea is consistent throughout the scriptures. When you see Daniel looking at prophecy, he says, I saw a whirlwind. I saw the wind striving upon the sea. When Daniel looked at the nations, he always saw war, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. It is the same in the end of time. Mm -hmm. And never stops, brothers and sisters. Con consider. Okay. So here we have an example of God's one of God's chosen at a time going into spiritualism during the time where he is distressed because of the wars that are taking place. This gives us insight in regards to the time frame when the nations are angry, it is because of the wars. We also added Psalm 2 to that. Let's go ahead and go back there. And I'm going over the same verses, but brothers and sisters, I've gone over this study again multiple times. And every time I go over the study, personally, I'm finding a lot of new texts. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to give you those texts, brothers and sisters, because I'm going to do you a disservice, believe it or not. If I give you all the jewels... You won't have any for yourself, brothers and sisters. I kid you not. So I encourage you to go back, and you're going to see that the prophets all speak the same thing. And you're going to find so much more gold in that mind. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the Bible says in Psalms 2, we're reading about the nations being distressed, warring. We're reading about the nations being angry. This is all happening before probation closes, before the seven last plagues. Okay? The Bible says in Psalms 2, it says, why do the heathen rage? Question. Does that sound like people are angry? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let's keep reading. It says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And if you remember the point we made, the Bible says during the time when the heathen are raging, the people are imagining a vain thing. They are looking to an idol. And we specifically talked about how this is a time frame for the Sunday law, brothers and sisters. Okay. They are imagining something vain. They have come up with something from their own imaginations that's a vain thing. In the Bible, vanity, vain things are usually associated with idolatry, okay, for those who are thinking about it. But notice in verse 2, it gives us a little bit more understanding. It says, the kings, plural, notice, mm -hmm. of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel how? Together. Together, yeah. okay. So during the time when the nations are angrier and they're raging and they are coming up with a vain thing, the Bible says at this time the kings are setting themselves and taking counsel together. And brothers and sisters, I've already come across just last night how other nations now have to choose sides because of the ban. Mm -hmm. You would think that they would say, well, I'll do my own thing, but they want to stay friends with America. You need to consider what is recently happening is going to cause nations to draw a line. But don't they also want to keep terrorism out of their countries as well? I'm sure, but that's a side issue, exactly. believe it or not. Right. That's really a side issue. All right. um, because uh, statistically, the great amount of terrorism that has happened in America has been domestic, and it has not been ISIS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been a lot of I'm not going to call out the groups, Science. but people who disagree with abortion, disagree with a lot of the laws that exist in America. So not exactly ISIS. So um, when we say, well, they're trying to just keep terrorists out, where it's terrorists already in, that's Americans. What are you going to do about those people? You see, so side issue. Let's keep reading, though. Let's not get too far away. Verse two, the Bible says the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, 
Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Okay. You remember what we discussed when we talk about when we talked about God laughing. When does God laugh? Does anyone know? Go to Proverbs 1. He laughs at our calamities. He laughs when calamities come. Yes, you're right. So the Bible is teaching us that in this time in which we're living, when the kings are coming together, when the nations are warring, it's going to be great calamity, brothers and sisters. Not only is there going to be great calamity, you're going to see great spiritualism among the religious ones. Okay? We're used to seeing spiritualism on the outside of the church. But the Bible says during this time, for those who have been unwilling to yield to the Spirit of God, they have defaulted to Satan. They're going to go to God, but it won't be God. That's what the Bible is illustrating. But he says this is going to be during the time of great calamity. The Bible says here in Proverbs 1, Proverbs 1 in verse 24, notice what time the Bible is teaching us that we're living in. And it says here in verse 24, Proverbs 1 in verse 24, the whole chapter is, 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 is powerful when you think about it, but we're only going to apply a few verses. Proverbs 1 and verse 24 says, Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded it, but ye have set at naught all my counsel it will, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your what? Calamity. calamity. So when God is shown to be laughing, it's during a time of calamity, brothers and sisters. And the Bible goes on to say, uh, I will mock when your fear cometh. Notice verse 27. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as what? A whirlwind. A whirlwind. This is tying it all together. Because remember, the Bible says men's hearts will fail because of fear of the things that are coming on the earth. But then he says when this fear comes like a desolation, he says like a whirlwind. Why does he say whirlwind? Because when the whirlwind comes, it means it's war coming. Consider, these are all terms we are familiar with as we study prophecy. He's trying to paint the big picture for us to see what we can expect in the near future. The Bible goes on to say here, verse 27, When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as whirlwind, when what? Distress. Distress. There it is again. He says, and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Isn't that what happened to Saul? Mm -hmm. When he was distressed, mm -hmm. he went to find Samuel. But it was too late. God says, I had always stretched out my hand, but you did not regard it now. I, I will not answer you. Mm. The Bible says in verse 29, For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would, they would none of my counsel, and they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of the fool shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet, notice, from the fear of evil. That fear that men will have will be from the fear of evil. Mm -hmm. They will recognize that there is nothing that they can now do. This is after close of probation, obviously. No, it's not. This is just before. I see. Yes. Remember, the time frame is during the time when the nations are angry. Okay. That is a time when they are distressed. That is the time when calamity is going to happen. Specifically, and I, I can follow your train of thought, mm -hmm. this is coming at a time because these events that we're discussing lead up to the close of probation. Mm -hmm. So when God says, listen, uh, it is too late for you, he's saying, you know, we've come to the end of all things. Mm -hmm. It was during this time that we have now that we have to make it right, brothers and sisters, because we are just before. The Bible shows that very clearly. Okay, So let's jump back to Psalms 2. I don't mean to rush. Let's kind of move a little bit quicker. Please take notes. The Bible says here, verse 4. I'll read it again. Don't forget the timeline. The nations were angry. All that we've been reading so far discuss what's happening when the nations are angry or when the nations are warring. This is a great time of distress, okay? This is a time of war. This is a time of spiritualism, even. This is a time of calamity. And if you ever read Great Controversy, she talks about how one of Satan's final things that he's going to do is bring great calamity and then present himself as the benefactor of man, how he can 
heal all the diseases. This is, yes, that's why I tell you, brothers and sisters, we need to really take up the work of medical missionary. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? Our families are going to go to miracle workers. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. That's true. When they see that they can be healed, when people are in pain, they just want to be healed. Yeah. I've had a toothache before. I was willing to do anything, brothers and sisters. I remember, I'll be very quick, I had a toothache in Africa where I'm like, Lord, I'm not sure about these hospitals. When that toothache came, I said, take me to the first hospital you can find. Was this before you got married? Uh, no, right after. Oh, okay. Yes, right after. Maybe that's why you motivated to have a dentist. Yes, yes. And a wife. <laughs> it was after, though. <laughs> now, but, when, uh, we're, when we're reading uh, Psalms 2, uh, yes. verse 2, yes. can we um, uh, intelligently uh, focus mm -hmm. or, or tie this with Revelation chapter 17? Yes, yes. And on our last conference call, that's what we did at the end of our study. We talked about how Revelation 17 talked about those kings having one mind. Okay, so we'll visit that verse just before we close. Yes, sir. So let's read Psalms 2 and verse 4. So as I said, we'll, re we'll visit that verse just before we close because it is, as you said, it's directly related to kings coming together with one mind to fight against God's people. Uh, first, they're going to fight against the Lord. Then the Bible says, and his anointed or then his people. Okay. And it's interesting, brothers and sisters, because one of the things that we have to consider is God is allowing Islam to come upon the world to recognize the time. Mm -hmm. We need to be aware of that, okay? God, in allowing Islam to come, is showing great mercy. Mm -hmm. I think about Joseph's story. You know, it was the Islamists or the Ishmaelites that allowed things to work out, as it were. It was God the whole time. While they were trying to kill Joseph, the Ishmaelites were the ones who showed up and said, don't worry, we'll buy him. Mm -hmm. Gave them time. Right now, we have time. Time for what? Time to work. Yeah. Okay. I want to read this. I'll take your comment just after we read. Okay. Psalms 2, verse 4. Let's try to get through Psalms. It says, He that sitteth in heaven shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then, notice, shall he speak unto them how? In his wrath. In his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Now, I hope you caught that. Okay. The same timeline in Psalms 2 is the same timeline in Revelation 11. Okay. Remember Revelation 11? It says, and the nations were angry and thy wrath has come. Psalms 2 says the heathen are raging and God will speak in his wrath. The same timeline. So what we're reading in Psalms 2 is directly related to the same events. Okay, It's the same story. The prophets are subject one to another. Okay, Let's keep reading here. Verse 6. Let's make sure. In verse 6 he says, Yet I have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Did we read that in Revelation 11? Mm -hmm. Yes. Remember, those in heaven said, The kingdom of this world have become the kingdom of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. Here God is speaking. He's saying, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. It's very interesting when you see God talk about his son. He calls him God, calls him a king. God has high hopes for his son in the sense of the gospel, brothers and sisters. And then in verse 7 it says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Now consider this. We will say, man, this is definitely speaking of Christ. But did you know that in the end of time, those who stand the test will be God's literal son? We call him the 144,000, but 144,000 are Israel who was the child of promise. Did you know that? Jesus was the child of promise. Israel was a type of Christ. We need to consider. This applies to God's people too. Goes on to say, verse 8, Ask of me of the heathen, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the othermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And it says, Thou shalt break them with the rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That's what we read in Daniel chapter 2, right? When this kingdom is set up, he's going to break them in pieces. This is referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So what we've established thus far is in harmony with Revelation 11, the nations being angry is talking about a time where the nations are coming together to war, to fight, 
to come especially against God's people, but before that, they come against someone else. And we discussed this. If you go to Genesis 16. But isn't it true they're not going to come against God's people until they refuse to keep Sunday as their day of worship? Well, let's read it. <laughs> let's read it. Let's see what the Bible says is going to happen. Okay, Genesis chapter 16 is the prophecy that we've been studying the whole time, believe it or not. What we have been studying is the fulfillment of the prophecy. But in Genesis 16 is when God first gives the prophecy of what's going to happen in the end. And what it makes it clear to us is the reason why the nations are going to come together. Okay, and the Bible says here in Genesis chapter 16, we're going to go ahead and start here in verse 10. Genesis 16 and verse 10, it says, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, this is the angel of the Lord speaking to Hagar. You can look in verse 8 just to be clear. But I'm reading verse 10. Genesis 16 and verse 10, it says, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's, notice, hand, singular, against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that, that spake unto her, Thou God seest me, for she said, I have also here looked after him that seeth me. Notice all that happens in the story of Hagar. The Bible makes very clear that her son has a prophecy. When we go back into the Bible and we read about Israel, and we read the prophecy of Israel, every time we read that prophecy, do you know we naturally now bring it to our day? Have you ever considered when you read about Israel, you bring it all the way to our present time. When we read about Ishmael, we don't do that. Why not? It's a prophecy. It's speaking of the end. Did you know all the prophecies point to the end, brothers and sisters? All of them. So we sometimes neglect the prophecy God gave to Ishmael, and we almost forget that Ishmael was Abraham's son. Ishmael was special to God also, brothers and sisters. God says... This man is going to be against every man and every man's hand against him. So the Bible prophesied that a time will come where Ishmael will be against everyone and everyone will be against him. We have come to that time, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. so, so isn't that the utilization of the principle of repetition and enlargement? Yes, it is. All the way through. Yes, you're very right. That is what is applied in order to come to these conclusions. Mm -hmm. So be clear, though. God gives us a little bit more insight in this verse, and we talked about it. You notice what Hagar said about her experience? About this experience with Ishmael? She said, God sees me. This tells us something about the time when Ishmael will be fighting against every man, and every man against him. This is during a time when God is looking at man. It's judgment time. And oftentimes we look and we say, well, you know, what does Islam really mean? Islam really means judgment. Islam really brings to view Hagar's experience where she recognized in reference to Ishmael that God was over watching the whole time, which means when you recognize Ishmael and his future and his place in prophecy, you also need to recognize what Hagar recognized, that God is looking at us. She didn't think Ishmael was worth anything. If you think about it, she says, my mistress has cast me away. I am worthless. My son is worthless. God says, no, he has an end time role in prophecy. He's he very important. He does love all of his creation. But he wants us to recognize what, his, what Ishmael's mom recognized about Ishmael. And that is, he's going to have a specific role. And that role is directly tied to God's view of mankind. God is looking at us. Let's look at a few more texts in closing. Let's go to Psalms 83. Psalms 83. We're looking at Psalms 83. We're keeping the timeline in view. The nations will be angry. Everything that we're studying right now is during the time when the nations are angry or when the nations are warring. Now we know why they're angry and who they are warring against. 
That is Ishmael, brothers and sisters. How do I know it's Ishmael? Because the Bible says every man's hand will be against him. The nation represents every man, brothers and sisters. So the Bible has tied the prophecy given by Moses because Moses was a prophet. Don't forget. He's given the prophecy mentioned by Moses and he's tied it to the prophecy of John. The nations were angry. The nations are angry because of Ishmael, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in Psalms 83. Sure, sure. Psalms 83 and verse 1. The Bible says here. Psalms 83 and verse 1 in the Bible reads, it says, Keep not thou silent, O God. Hold not thy peace and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. Notice the language. Mm -hmm. Those who are fighting against God. Do you remember Psalms told us that they will be fighting against God and then they will be fighting against his anointed or God and his anointed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right now, people are not aware that they're fighting against God. They don't know it, brothers and sisters. We're going to see it's very similar to Paul. Mm. Remember Paul? He was self-righteous, mm. extremely religious, fighting against people, not knowing he was actually fighting against God. The world is going to try to stop Islam, but they don't have the power to stop Islam. Mm. Only God has the power to stop Islam because God predicted that what they're doing, they will do. They are accomplishing a work for him, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. It's to allow his people to be able to finish the work, brothers and sisters. Because it's holding back the Vatican's efforts. It's holding back, you could say the Vatican, but it's holding back the power that wants to fight against God's people mm -hmm. from spreading the truth in regards to God's character, his holy Sabbath. They are not worried about us right now. We have time to discuss the Sabbath. We have time to give the third angel. They're worried about another fundamentalist group. Mm -hmm. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the Bible says here in Psalms 83, we're going to read again in verse 2 because the Bible is painting the same picture. It says, For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up their head. So it's talking about a group of people in a singular way. They that hate thee, the Bible says, thine enemies, thee, all of these are a head. Okay? They are the head. They are the power that is lifting up. Now, if you remember, brothers and sisters, in the Bible, when someone stands up, lifts up, it's representing a kingdom. In our time, did you know there's another kingdom that will stand up? <laughs> we call it the Ten Kings. We call it the seventh head of Bible prophecy. As one head, they will actually lift up before the end, brothers and sisters. So the Bible teaches us. So we're reading about a time where we, we usually call it the one world union. That's what we're reading about. The Bible says that this is the time where the nations are angry. When they're raging and they're imagining this vain thing. This, they're coming up with a way to force people into worship. Or the they're coming up with a way to actually before that to mm -hmm. fight. ISIS yes, that. yes. But remember, the world fighting ISIS is a religious war. It's a war of worship, believe it or not. They're simply saying the way you worship is incorrect. It's not just you're inhumane. We disagree with your religion. That's what the world is saying to ISIS. We need to consider they're never separated from their religion. So if you fight them, it's not just an earthly battle, earthly war. It's a religious war. And it's fought usually by the so-called Christian nations mm -hmm. who are fighting against Islam, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. So the Bible says, finishing, verse 2 again, it says, For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee, the tabernacles of Edom, and the Ishmaelites. Wait a minute. Did you catch that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Bible is talking about the kings coming together to fight against God and his people. But in mentioning God and his people, it also says they are against Edom and the Ishmaelites. Or the children of the east. The Islamists, brothers and sisters. 
So the Bible does show that the world is coming together not only to fight against God's people and God, but also the children of the East, those who believe in Muhammad, the Islamists. It goes on to say, the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarines, I don't know how to say that, pardon me, Jebel and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. So we're looking at this because this picture is pointing to the future. All of it doesn't necessarily apply, but the parts that do apply, apply, brothers and sisters. Let's add another verse to this. Let's go to Psalms 93. The only reason we're going to other places, we've already gone through Joel. We've already done Zephaniah. So now we're looking at the Psalms to even confirm this. We're looking at what the wise men said. We're looking at other prophets. The Bible says here in Psalm 93, notice in verse 1. It says, the Lord reigneth, he is clothed with majesty, the Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself, the world also is established that it cannot be moved, thy throne is established of old, thou art from everlasting, the floods have lifted up, wait a minute, what else did we just read, remember they have lifted up the head we read, the other one says they have come together and they have lifted up. Now the Bible says a little different. It says, the floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. What is this talking about? Multitudes of people. Multitudes of people. Mm -hmm. But specifically here, they are now called the floods. Now it's interesting. Before they are referred to as the kings. And then there comes a point where they are referred to as the floods. Why the change? When the Bible references them as kings, it's in reference to them when they are fighting against Islam. When the Bible references them as floods, now it's talking about persecution. Let's ask Psalms 18 to make sure. Psalms 18. When we're talking about persecution, we're talking about those who are fighting against the truth. Those who are fighting against God, specifically his people. The Bible says, and it's very interesting, when that persecution comes... It's because the healing of the deadly wound has fully taken place. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? At that time, you see not only the kings, but you see the kings mixed with church. Mm -hmm. You see church and state, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. you see, the religion or the religious are not the ones necessarily going against Islam. It's the kings of the earth. Now, of course, they have religion and many of them are so-called Christians, but it is the rulers of the nations who are coming together to say, let's fight against that nation. The nations are angry. Mm. But then those nations as floods, meaning when they mix with church and state, when they have the authority of the church, they're going to lift up and fight against God's people, brothers and sisters. The Bible says it like this in Psalms 18. Psalms 18, and we're going to start in verse 4. We are familiar with this verse. Actually, I'll start in verse 1. Psalms 18 and verse 1, it says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength. In whom will I trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower? Now, this verse is powerful, brothers and sisters. You notice all these things that God has called during this time? It's important, Okay. All of these descriptions that are given during a time of persecution are necessary. You think about how much you will lose when you're persecuted. You're going to need God to be a provider. You're going to need him to be a father, a comforter, a help. You're going to need God to be everything that you are in need of at that time. It's pretty interesting how it is illustrated. And he says, I will love thee. You know, we only say that statement at certain times. You don't just say, hey, I will love thee. You usually say, I will love thee when the love is challenged, brothers and sisters. Think about when your love is challenged with a family member. Regardless of what, you, what they do, what do you say? I'm going to love you. I'll still love you. It doesn't matter what you do. It's when the love is challenged that you make these type of statements. So we're reading about somebody who is going through great tribulation, great persecution. He says in verse 3, notice. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The sorrows of death compass me, notice, and the floods 
of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me in my what? Distress. Wait a minute. What time is this? It's a time of distress. Brothers and sisters, it's not just a time of distress for the world. I hope you know. It's a time of distress for everyone. What we will go through, brothers and sisters, every human will feel it, as they say. Nobody's going to escape the pressures of what we have to deal with in this life. doesn't matter who you are. When you're hungry, it's not easy. So does that include the 144,000? It includes everyone, my brother. It's going to be a distressing time for all of us. But God's people will have a buckler. Amen. They will have a strength. Amen. When they get distressed, they just call on the Lord. That's the difference, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. When the world gets distressed, they call on the Lord because they still call. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, when it gets bad, everybody calls on God, brothers and sisters. But God says at that time, he will not answer them. Well, the corporation disclosed at that time. You're right. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing is, remember, the nations are angry. That time frame exists all the way until the close of probation. So we're always going to see it coupled together because they are directly tied together. That is a timeline. The nations are angry, the things before the coming of Christ, and then the close of probation. That's how the Bible paints that picture. Okay? Let's finish this verse here. Verse 6, he says, The earth, the, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. Now notice, this is so powerful. He heard my voice out of his temple. <laughs> and my cry came before him, even into his ears. Now, you know why this is powerful? Because remember, brothers and sisters, when we started our study on the trumpets, eventually there comes a time where the censer is thrown down. So what is the Bible illustrating? You talk to God directly, brothers and sisters. Remember, many people say, you know, you better, you got to get ready for the time when there is no mediator. That time is not bad for God's people. Because at that time, the work of the mediator is finished. He is done mediating. Now they are at peace with God. They can talk to God with no problem, brothers and sisters. So this is what we're reading here. We're reading at the end of time, at the end of probation, where they can pray and ask God anything, and he hears them in the temple directly, brothers and sisters. Christ's work is finished for them. They will forever be together, brothers and sisters. It's a glorious story. And it says in verse 7, The earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was what? Raw. Wrong. When God is wroth, because of his anger, his indignation, the plagues take place. Mm -hmm. Plagues take place once probation is closed. The nations can be angry as long as they want at that point. They can stay angry. It's too late. Let's close. Let's go to Psalms 124. I would encourage you. Actually, go back to Psalms 93. We didn't finish that verse. But I want to go ahead and read it. Go ahead and read the rest of it. Psalms 93, and then we'll look at Psalms 124, it says, and Psalms 93, verse 3, the floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier, praise God, than the noise of many waters, yea, mm -hmm. than the mighty waves of the sea. You remember when Christ said, peace be still? That's a promise to us, brothers and sisters. That time of that story, at that time of that story, you know those people were terrified. They thought they were going to die. And then it was Christ who said, peace be still. I pray that you would contemplate that story because that will be, that is a spiritual reality for us. When the waves on every side look like we're going to be overwhelmed, we're going to die, we're going to lose everything. And God will say, I have control. Let those things cease. Rescue, right? wow. Yes, brother. Yes. Last verse here says, Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. When somebody says those statements, it means something has been confirmed. When you say the testimonies of God are sure, it's different than when you say the testimonies of God are very sure. That means they've been tested, brothers and sisters. Psalms 124. We'll go ahead and end with this verse, and then hopefully uh, the time we come together will... We'll start with uh, Psalm, Revelation 17. Uh, as I said, there's only a little bit more uh, we can go back over. Um, I'll probably just make sure we're clear that Islam is um, identified or, or symbolized as locusts, as canker worms, so on and so forth. 
just so we can be clear that we're making the right interpretation of these prophecies um, and that we'll be able to really follow Islam and prophecy. Um, you can expect a lot more things to happen. Um, and that should mean for us that we're doing a lot more work. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, don't allow Islam to be in prophecy without Israel being in prophecy. Um, as you look at Abraham's story, forever after he had those kids, Islam and Ishmael were both in prophecy mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. You see the children of East throughout, brothers and sisters, they always had to deal with Israel. We need to let that be the case now. Don't allow Islam to be doing everything where the world knows Islam, but the world doesn't know Israel. Because we're not doing anything. So may we take advantage of the time that we have. Won't there be something significant when the embassy, American embassy, is moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? I don't believe so. You don't think so? No, okay. and I say that because uh, a lot of modern day teachers try to include literal Israel in prophecy. And in prophecy, literal Israel, as in the sense of Israel, the nation Israel, Palestine, they don't have a role. Um, if you want to include them, then you have to include them where the Bible includes them. And what Paul says is, even till this day, there's a veil over their eyes. So until they accept Christ, they will not be his people. Now, the interesting thing is, if they accept Christ as literal Israelites, then they can become spiritual Israel. Okay, but aren't there quite a few yeah. Jews in Israel now mm -hmm. that are born again Christians? I hope so. I don't know, actually. But I hope so because... If not, then that means we as God's people are greatly failing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I do hope so. Yes, sister. I read in Spirit of Prophecy where she said that, uh, well, God said that um, don't count the, the literal Jews out. Oh, yes. Yeah, you read that before? Um, I think I read it, something it about was, it. Yeah, it was pretty encouraging just how he said that these will be, um, they know so much about the Sabbath mm -hmm. that they will be... Um, very powerful in explaining it. Like if in the end, mm -hmm. that there is going to be some Jews that. Oh, that's a blessing. I know it. It was like. And wow. actually, you know, it's funny. That's confirmed in the scripture when uh, Paul is talking about them as a branch, and he says a branch. The branch can be put back because it was already there. Mm -hmm. It's what he kind of concludes in the end. So. Amen. May we pray that they are faithful because. Not even those for backsliders. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So I they hope. can be engrafted back in. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If we're faithful.